pleasure alike to welcome you on behalf of uh, India International Center in Delhi. Well, let me start again. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the India International Center. My name is KP Fabian. The center is in Delhi, but I am in Bangalore now. This is the advantage of a webinar. Now, it is Tete, head of program division of the IAC, who have brought us together in cyberspace. Despite her self-chosen invisibility, permit me to say on your behalf, thank you, Tete. We are privileged to have an exceptionally qualified panel. Um, we have Dr. Anuradha Shinoy from Delhi, Dr. T.V. Paul uh, from Montreal, and uh, I'm just trying to make sure that we have the third panelist, uh, Dean Kehmeyer, MD from Denver, Colorado. Uh, I'm running into some connectivity problems, but let's see. Now, our subject is President Biden's foreign policy. Obviously, <laughs> the President of the United States, whom the Secret Service calls the POTUS, you know, the word POTUS is associated with a lot of power, potency. Now, the President has enormous power which can be used for good or not. It is circumscribed to an extent by the Senate, whose advice and consent is required for foreign policy decisions, such as ratification of treaties. Now, Biden came to the White House with the longest experience in foreign policy. Senator at 29 in 1972. He's going to be 80 soon. Eh? He chaired the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the powerful committee, twice, 2001 to 2003 and 2007 to 2009. He was vice president for eight years under Obama. Yet, yet, his first year has disappointed many of us, including his well-wishers. Permit me to use an acronym because in uh, Delhi, the use of acronyms is getting very, very, what shall I say, is proliferating. So permit me to use an acronym, AIU, Afghanistan, Iran, Ukraine. Now, President Biden, to my mind, had blundered in Afghanistan on many counts. Now, the latest is that he has taken over $3.5 billion belonging to, the Afghan, belonging to Afghanistan to compensate the victim families of 9-11. Coming to Iran as candidate he promised to rejoin the Obama-era nuclear deal with Iran, JCPOA, Joint Common Program of Action. Trump had wrongly walked out of it. Biden has failed to deliver on that count so far. And it has geopolitical implications. Now, Ukraine. Biden or his spokespersons have been telling us they have been forecasting that President Putin was about to invade Ukraine in the next few days. Now, I believe the media have carried uh, a report that uh, Zelensky on his Facebook has said that uh, the invasion is going to start tomorrow, 16th of August, at 3 a.m. local time. We do not know, of course, but we also see reports that uh, some of the Russian troops are going back. Uh, frankly, we do not know whether Putin is going to oblige 
Biden by invading. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are not uh, serving a pre-cooked dinner. There have been no consultations among, uh, uh, you know, uh, between uh, the distinguished speakers and myself. Uh, um, so we want to make it as interactive as possible. The Q&A following the presentations by the panelists is very important for the India International Center. Uh, you will see um, that, you know, there's a Q&A box on your screen at the bottom and you can write your questions and if you like you can address it to a particular panelist now the panelists have indicated that each would speak for about 10 minutes or maximum 12 minutes or if it's only two panelists eventually it can be longer now ladies and gentlemen let us fasten our seat belt and take off Dr. Anuradha Mitra Shinoy has kindly agreed to address us first. She needs no introduction to the IIC audience. She was professor and dean at the famous School of International Studies, JNU. Um, now, before I request her to speak, I want to share something with you, both uh, Professor uh, Shinoy and uh, Dr. Paul and I have a common guru in uh, Dr. T. T. Paulos. Uh, well, dear Professor Shinoy, we request you to address us now. Um, Ambassador Fabian, distinguished co-panelists and friends who are watching. Uh, this webinar is on one year of uh, the Biden foreign policy. And uh, what I'm doing is uh, I'm going to set it in what he has said himself, his own declaration, where he said that the twin pillars of his foreign policy would be one, renewed diplomacy, and two, multilateralism. So the objective, obviously, of Biden's declaration was to overturn Trump's foreign policy disasters of alienating the EU, not paying attention to NATO, the obsession uh, with containing China, uh, pushing Iran out of negotiations, uh, being soft on Putin, uh, etc. So let us see whether Biden's first year performance conforms to his twin pillars of renewed diplomacy and multilateralism. I cite three cases to set this bar. Number one, in the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which Ambassador Fabian just mentioned, it was completely mismanaged. It became another marker for the surrender and defeat of US interventionism. And Biden bypassed consultation with his allies, with Europe, and left the international community with a long-term humanitarian crisis. So there was neither diplomacy nor multilateralism in this case. Case two, his focus on the Indo-Pacific where there are already two US armadas with the objective of containing China. The Biden administration security partnership with the US and UK, UK called the AUKUS trilateral uh, partnership is actually a call to arms and nuclearization of the Indo-Pacific. It confronts China very clearly. Second, it threatens the no international non-proliferation regime Third, it cut France out of their Australia submarine deal in a very underhand way. And it undid relations with Paris. It centers Australia in a potential war mode and militarization against China. And it ups the stakes in the Indo-Pacific. So again, I didn't see either multilateralism or diplomacy 
in this case. Case three is the most severe, and that is the crisis in the Ukraine. Of course, in this, at the currently we all know that America is in a tizzy declaring that Russia is going to invade. It's like every day the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. And um, their point of view has come out very clearly, Biden's point of view. And Putin has provided that uh, standoff by amassing over 100,000 troops on the border. And Biden has said that if they invade, they will face debilitating sanctions. And of course, um, according to the US and EU and NATO partners, uh, Ukraine as a sovereign nation has a right to join NATO. But what is the Russian position? Why are they doing this? Why are they inviting these sanctions and are they going to invade? There are three quick points that I'm going to make. One, Russia is continuously saying it will not invade. It is not interested in invasion, but they want a legal guarantee which will guarantee their security position because their argument is that number one, there can be no security in Europe without giving some guarantees to Russia also. It cannot be security against a whole bunch of countries against Russia. That's one, they want some legal document. Second, Russia believes that it no longer trusts the US and NATO as the promises that NATO has and led by the US has made to them for two decades have been broken. Through the 1990s, with the Soviet collapse and a weakened Russia, Russia made repeated offers of collaboration and better relations with NATO. And there is a slew of documents and meetings which show this. Gorbachev said that he was withdrawing from Bel uh, East Berlin um, if um, NATO didn't expand and the then Secretary of State promised it, but nonetheless, that didn't happen. Uh, then the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, uh, signed, you know, they had that Paris Charter, they signed a mutual cooperation for steps in peace and security in Europe uh, with Russia in 1990. Yeltsin made several concessions, uh, partnership for peace, uh, and then later uh, the foundation document, uh, the, the Russia-NATO foundation document, the council which was set up, but none of these really functioned. Then again, when Putin came, let's forget about um, even Yeltsin and a week in Russia. There was no attempt to incorporate Russia in any, uh, any kind of dialogue. When Putin became president, and uh, that was the time of 9-11 and the American war against terror, Russia again repeatedly made concessions. They could have the flyover zone on Russia. They, they, Russia would not, um, you know, kind of push in West Asia. Um, but over these years, first 10 countries of the East Europe and Central East Europe joined NATO and then another four, the Baltics. So in a sense, Russia was completely surrounded. And they were tired of appealing for some kind of neutrality. But these countries have missiles and they are fully prepared for war against Russia also in case of. So now they have stood their ground firmly on the issue of Ukraine. Now, Ukraine is different than the rest of the Central East Europe in that I think Russia has no interest in invading Ukraine. What they wanted from Ukraine, they have already got. One, Crimea had a referendum and legally joined Russia. They are part of Russia. They were always part of Russia, except in 1956 when you know there, there was a gift as part of the Soviet Union and these things happened. Second, there, was this, there has been a seven year war in the Donbas region, which is right next to uh, Russia's borders. And it is dominated, 90% of it speak Russian and 80% are ethnic Russians. And the politics in Ukraine 
has been such in the last few years, especially under Zelensky, where with a surge of right-wing nationalism and xenophobic nationalism, these people have felt more threatened. And there is a fear from Russia that the Minsk agreement, which was signed between Russia, um, the uh, you know, countries of NATO and Ukraine, which would give the Donbass region, uh, Lugansk and uh, uh, et cetera, autonomy, that may not be fulfilled. And Russia cannot afford any kind of ethnic onslaught against ethnic Russians. So this is their position. Now, if the US was interested in negotiation, they would talk of the Minsk agreement. They could talk of a method of how Ukraine could be, security could be guaranteed. NATO security could be guaranteed. They could have an arrangement like they do with Finland, where Finland is not part of NATO, but it is very close to the NATO countries. So then my concluding points, therefore, beside all my three case studies, and the case of Iran, uh, which Ambassador Fabian raised earlier, showed that Biden has different motives, which has prompted him to up this and escalate instead of de-escalate or use diplomacy or multilateralism. And his motives are one, to retain the US in Europe, same as in the beginning of the Cold War, have the US in, Russia out, Germany down, very similar. Second, to consolidate NATO as a US military arm and to further contain both Russia and China. This is where he differs from Trump, who wanted to contain China and not have a two front kind of policy. But Biden believes that China, and he knows China is too strong uh, and it, that it's very tied to the, the US economic uh, system. Third, he wants to enhance U.S. energy control in uh, Europe, especially with Germany, uh, the Nord 2 stream pipeline. He is not interested in this partnership between Russia and uh, Germany, and this is a good moment for him to break that and to push for the U U.S. gas um, supplies, etc. That's a whole different uh, ballgame. Four, he wants to keep a check on Germany and France, who have been making very clear noises about a more independent policy vis-a-vis -vis of EU vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And five, of course, he wants to maintain a unipolarity, US exceptionalism, militarism as part of American nationalism and foreign policy. So therefore, and this is my last point, in all his foreign policy actions, Biden has one, neither used diplomacy nor multilateralism, but he's used force, international intrigue, and covered it with strong narrative of threat, even if it is a staring down con contest. Two, he has overridden even the voices from Ukraine and Zelensky. Zelensky, if you see all his speeches, which I have followed, Sounds very confused and yesterday's speech seemed like it had written by someone else. Sometimes he says, we don't see any threat. Sometimes he, he says that give us you know, some more arms and protect ourselves. Uh, sometimes he's talking to Macron, sometimes he's talking to Biden. So there's confusion and fear and uh, ambiguity there. Third, he, Biden has managed to slight diplomatically both France and Germany's attempts at negotiated settlement and obviously threatened them about NATO unity, which they have obviously cowered to. And Biden needs to justify American presence, continued presence in Europe. Meanwhile, the strategic partnership between Russia and China has deepened in unprecedented ways. I'm not saying that it is on account of this, this is a long thread which is happening and will continue. So lastly, therefore, Biden may want to continue with his unipolar ways, but he can get a bipolar response in an irreversibly multipolar world. Thank you very much. I'll close here.
You're on mute, um, Ambassador Fabian. We can't hear you. Yes, I'm trying to get. Is that better now? One second. Is it better now? Yes. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anuratha, for you know that insightful account. And you have compressed into 10 minutes and dot so much, uh, so many points. And I personally agree entirely with you, but uh, maybe the distinguished audience have questions uh, which will come up later. Now, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, uh, TV, Professor T.V. Paul from Montreal. Well, you know, he is a McGill professor uh, at uh, the university. He has, has uh, written and authored many books. I won't sort of list them, but uh, I just want to mention that he was a Peace Scholar. He, Peace Scholar, he got the Peace Scholar Award from U.S. Institute of Peace Washington, D.C. in 1989. That is very significant for us. In fact, it's significant for all of us because we need more peace. Now, uh, Professor Paul, uh, I just wanted to raise one or two doubts. As Professor Anuradha mentioned, you know the style of diplomacy. You will remember that uh, at the first uh, foreign minister level talks at Anchorage, Blinken, Secretary of State, in the presence of TV cameras, he scolded his counterpart, obviously in English, that was translated into Chinese, and his counterpart gave it back to him, obviously in Chinese, and then uh, interpreted into English, and I think it was more than one round. Now, you know, I am no scholar, uh, and uh, I did practice diplomacy for a while, but that was in the last millennium. Now, for me, it would have been unheard of, because in any such gathering, when the camera is there, we say nice things about each other. <laughs> we say that, you know, we look forward to the successful conclusion you know, of this uh, conference when this is very important and all that. So why is this new style? And also, as Professor Anuradha mentioned, you know, even before he talks to Putin, Biden tells the whole world, I'm going to tell him that he will have to pay heavy price, unimaginably heavy price. So why is this style? So over to you, <clears throat> Professor Paul. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Fabian and uh, Professor Anuradha. It's uh, wonderful to see you again. Um, let me begin by saying that many of the things they are saying is for domestic consumption. He knows his domestic standing is rather weak and uh, he has to act tough. And in foreign policy, sometimes is a, a, a good uh, opportunity for showing the toughness that he cannot achieve in domestic uh, issue areas. But let me touch on some of that. Uh, and I do agree with uh, Professor Anuradha's contention that uh, the Western propaganda at this point com completely ignores uh, the Russian point of view. And uh, I am also sympathetic to Ukraine as a country that suffered a lot over several millennia, let's put it that way, the, the uh, Mongols uh, used to go there and uh, massacre millions of Ukrainians, kids and families. And they have this uh, big statue showing that black death, they call it, it comes periodically and they were on the path to Europe. Uh, the Russians did the same thing under Stalin, uh, massive uh, collectivization in the uh, horrendous pain to the to the Ukrainians, the famines, etc. So they have an urge to um, become independent of Russia, but they are in the wrong geopolitical space. This is their problem. It's a bit like Mexico or Canada trying to form an alliance with uh, the West. I mean, from with China or uh, with Russia in the in that sense. Um, these big powers have uh, their 
aspiration is their status. They are very much interested in maintaining their spheres of influence. Russia weakened, Soviet Union weakened, as we know, considerably after the collapse of the, uh, uh, the Soviet Union and the Eastern European Warsaw Pact system. But Russia's national ego has not weakened. It's still, its people still consider themselves as a great power along with the United States. Uh, they are reluctant to give China the role yet. Many people think they are uh, friends, but uh, alliance is a bit hard to form there. So Putin is trying to reassert lost status, lost prestige. And he is uh, one person who he thinks can probably reestablish some remnants of this uh, Russian glory because he has the experience, he now has some money through oil and gas. He's also able to convince some Europeans, Germany in particular, that their concern should be addressed. And Professor Anurada mentioned this uh, whole uh, agreement that the West gave when the Soviet Union agreed to uh, allow Germany to unify in 1990. In fact, I was going through the National Archives uh, released materials we suggest that the Russians have a case. Um, Gorbachev was given again and again the no written assurance. This is one of the dumbest things the Russians ever did. Uh, but other assurances saying that uh, James Baker, Secretary of State at that time, stating not an inch forward for NATO. But under Clinton, and uh, um, there were other assurances from West Germany. Chancellor uh, Kohl, uh, there were assurances from Thatcher, uh, there were quite a few assurances, all in private conversation, but many of them are recorded. Um, and Gorbachev naively, uh, I have a lot of respect for him, so I'm saying this rather carefully, um, agreed to that. But Yeltsin was the one who completely just taken um, into a situation where both Clinton and uh, Bush, uh, Clinton in particular, gave some money and everything, and then Yeltsin was not able to fight back this expansion. Now, from the point of view of the smaller European, small East European states, NATO is a defensive alliance. But from the point of view of the Soviet uh, Russia, it is an offensive alliance. They read history too much. They have three episodes of Western aggressions. First was Napoleon, as we know. Then uh, 18, uh, 1917, revolutionary Bolsheviks were attacked. Then uh, Hitler's offensive 1938 or so. And so you have this um, um, extraordinary uh, history and um, then a desire to be a powerful actor in world politics. So there are three kinds of status anxieties that are going on right now. One is America is on decline relative decline, which means others are catching up, China in particular. Russia is going through, uh, militarily they are doing very well. They have technology, they have scientists, they have that infrastructure, but may not have the kind of economic strength to compete on an even keel. But they do have assets in terms of diplomatic, good diplomacy and skills that they acquired during the Cold War. What they are doing is coercive diplomacy, essentially threatening your target that if you don't act, we will use force. It has limitations. And so the American problem is United States hasn't yet reconciled to the, uh, the end of American hegemony, as we call it. The American victory or so-called victory in the Cold War lasted basically two decades. Uh, or maybe slightly more. So by 2008, 2009 financial crisis, this has come to the sort of starting point, winding down of this unipolar moment that they thought would continue for a long period of time. So they made a number of assumptions. So globalization, deepened globalization is to blame quite a bit. It has done good things and bad things geopolitically, it is the unwinding of this American supremacy because what happened was many of the opening to China in particular, 
uh, drained the American manufacturing sector and created uh, a lot of uh, anxiety for the lower white middle class. Those are not college educated and they are uh, really at the losing end. Industrial era employment gave them assurance they could buy a house, they can have all the middle class things people aspire for. They could lead a life that uh, would somehow provide them guarantee the children would go to college, etc. This has become very difficult because if you don't have proper skill set uh, in this technological era, uh, jobs are very difficult to get. Although now there is there are jobs, but they are service jobs, and many of them don't want to do that job uh, as such. That also affected the internal dynamics. You have extraordinary divisions. The United States was known for a kind of unity. The common enemy, by the way, is one way to create unity. And Cold War offered that, and that, that Cold War consensus came to an end. They're trying hard with China as a common enemy, but the differences are many. Impossible for um, US to create a cohesion until the Chinese threat is palpable. The Chinese threat is very cleverly, Xi Jinping has not militarily threatened the United States or its allies. It wants, of course, Taiwan and India as uh, contested territories, but that's very different from previous great powers. So Belt and Road Initiative is a very clever East India company strategy that will increase Chinese power and position. If it succeeds, of course, there will be a lot of failures and debt, debt and trap and et cetera. So what is happening in this context is Biden is a president who is uh, presiding over a period of transition, dramatic changes, and you now accentuated by the pandemic, economic crisis, and the rise of China. He's trying his best using the techniques and ideas they have over a period of time. One of them is, of course, they have the advantage of Western media, which uh, we think are completely free, not really. They just propagate whatever comes out of the White House as the gospel truth. So, but there is a problem. It will be very unfortunate that either party, Russia or United States, abandoned this long peace, so-called long peace, that we have had since 1945. Uh, uh, there's an interesting article in The Economist by this Israeli famous uh, historian about one of great greatest achievements of uh, this uh, 20th century after 1945 has been the absence of a great power war, which is very rare. In fact, great powers are the biggest threats to world peace and most violent actors. They kill their own, they kill each other, and then they cause all kinds of causes for uh, proxy wars and destruction of people and societies. Just look at the Middle East. Uh, the great powers cannot wash their hands. What we are witnessing in Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Iraq, their policies, their strategies are based on sometimes crude real politics. They think otherwise. And part of it is the liberal international order is in decline. The liberal international order created largely through American efforts and of course Western efforts are based on three pillars. One is democracy. Democratic states will engage in peaceful behavior and democracy promotion is good. The second is what you call international economic interactions, trade, investment, and high levels of interdependence will generate peace. The third is that international institutions will offer opportunities for disputes to settle and collective action problems to be solved. Now, all the three are under decline, partly due to globalization's impact, partly due to the fact that many of these things don't stay forever. The material conditions change, technology changes, aspirations change, and leadership changes. So when you get some very ambitious leaders, you have a different uh, situation as we are witnessing in China and Russia today. Internationally, democracy is under assault and the United States is going through that same process of democratic recession, as they call it, or retrenchment. 
many of the elements of a liberal democratic uh, system is under assault due to class divisions. Now it's another dimension that we should, we should go back to class analysis. Uh, we don't have to be Marxist to understand this. Class analysis is a big part of sociological, sociology literature. Essentially, capitalism is developing and developing into winners and losers. And uh, in that process, classes divide their capacity, their anxiety, and then they look at uh, what will provide a security, provide a uh, sense of uh, uh, important status. And that is what is happening in many of these countries that uh, earlier it used to be, you know, in Marxist times, it was proletarian working class uh, solidarity. There's nothing like that in the West anymore. It's basically looking up to other identity markers, such as religion, such as ethnicity. And uh, in the white world, of course, uh, white nationalism is emerging, submerged uh, uh, racism. All these are partly caused by globalization to some extent, migration of high skilled workers and the collaboration between these high skilled workers as well as multinational corporations, um, making the underclass uh, going further down again. So Biden is trying to change all that domestically. He tried to uh, come up with a number of programs and he has made some progress. The infrastructure pro uh, uh, bill and the, the funding, I think will have some major impact, but he is not uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. As you know, Roosevelt did a major revolution in the 30s and 40s, the, uh, the social security system and all the things. Roosevelt saved America. People forget that. If Roosevelt was not successful, the class divisions would have uh, caused civil war again. A lot of people returned from uh, World War II, the GIs. They were given all these benefits and then it was uh, Johnson's period, despite his debacle in Vietnam, he offered the idea of uh, uh, all kinds of uh, benefits for the blacks and uh, bringing them back into the civil rights mode. So the liberals and Democrats have done better than Republicans, but uh, that is not, the issue today is that Biden was hoping to become the next Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, he hasn't succeeded. He set the bar very high, and much of it is not his own fault. As I mentioned, the structural conditions are not in his favor. So what he can do is, of course, some policy adjustments. Uh, not only that, domestically, the Congress is evenly divided, and the Democrats are not able to achieve the consensus that they were, they were hoping. So it is a story that is ongoing. And the next uh, by elections, uh, the midterm elections uh, most likely will produce a Republican majority that will even constrain him further. Although he has uh, some good uh, desires and policy ideas, it is very unlikely that he is going to get much ahead. It will require a lot of depth uh, negotiations among Democrats if he can achieve some more domestic agenda before uh, the midterm elections. But in the foreign policy arena, I think the, I'll conclude by mentioning that the Iran deal is another one that he's pursuing now to bring it back, uh, the 19, uh, 2005 deal, as well as 15 deal back, which Trump uh, backed off. And uh, the blame was on US, the Trump administration. Iran was uh, pursuing, as far as we know, the deal and its uh, provisions. Now he is trying to do, but then Congress Republicans won't approve any agreement like the 2015 agreement because they don't want him to give uh, any victory to him. And so that is going to linger on. North Korea uh, will linger on. There's nothing much possible in that. He wants to focus on uh, China. I think that is very important that China doesn't, uh, China is, um, uh, deterred to some extent, but without a major containment policy as uh, during the Cold War. What we need is some more critical thinking on how to achieve what you call a peaceful power transition. China is going to be his biggest challenge. Chinese strategy is not the same close to its friendly warfare or a lot of noise making. 
although they have been with this wolf warrior diplomacy. But Chinese uh, power and Chinese uh, capabilities, and it is so interlinked with the West itself, which makes it hard to implement any policies unless there is a total rupture, which is unlikely to happen. So Biden is, uh, was a necessary uh, arrival because people were tired of Trump and his totally illogical as well as sometimes irrational actions. A foreign policy arena where he was uh, playing with uh, a lot of uh, choices which really hurt America's standing and hurt the livelihoods and, and lives of many millions of people. The problem with me, we ignore that the American policies have enormous implications for the rest of the world. They still hold many carrots and quite a bit of uh, power, military and economic, and they go into these regions often without a good exit plan. Um, I'm one of the critiques of American interventions. If you look at the majority of them were failures. Uh, majority of them were wars of uh, uh, choice, not, not wars of necessity. The only two ones I can think of are the 1950 Korean War, of course, and then the Afghan uh, attack. The rest are all wars of choice to show off the world that you are all underdogs, we are the top dog. But the liberals think otherwise. They think they, they went into for promoting democracy, promoting all these goods. But they say there is no postmark, a proper thinking that they could have been very different uh, hegemonic power. They didn't need to use so much power and so much tonnage of TNT and hurt the millions of poor and dispersers in the world. They could do a lot more. They are capable, by the way. This country has a lot of uh, assets, lots of goodwill. And it is one of the countries that uh, accepted people from the rest of the world. Uh, the Chinese are not even allowing, as far as I know, Indian tourists today. But most tourists are not coming. So you can never become a Chinese. You can never become a Russian. You can never become a Japanese either. This is only one country, including the other friends like Canada and Australia, and Britain to some extent, that find immigration useful. And so that demographic change, I want to conclude by saying that is also a cause of status anxiety to the societal arrangements. So within the next 20, 30 years, that demographic change will make it very impo impossible for the so-called uh, white uh, so, uh, class, lower class in particular, to have much of a control over the systems. That's partly why they are redrawing the districts. They're making sure that the Congress and Senate will stay with them. All these are going to create considerable societal conflict. So navigating this, both international uh, politics and domestic politics, um, that will require statesmanship, that require consensus, require support of people, and a charismatic leader. Biden, unfortunately, doesn't have that charisma. He's a good uh, taskmaster, though. One must uh, acknowledge his accomplishments. But sometimes makes these strong positions that many liberals do based on ideological predispositions or assumptions. Sometimes they don't pan out. That's because things are beyond their control. So the structural forces are shaping many of these choices. The choices sometimes don't uh, control the structural forces or forces beyond his control to some extent. Let me stop there. I'm sure we will have some Q&A here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Paul. You have been, if I may say so, holistic in your approach within the available time. You mentioned about uh, diplomacy for diplomatic statements for domestic consumption. Well, as we know, that is what is called public diplomacy. But that sort of public diplomacy can do much harm <laughs> to, you know, diplomacy which is meant to solve problems. Okay, now we do not have the third speaker because Anita had some problems uh, in connectivity and all that. So we move on. I have here a couple of questions. What I'm going to do is to sort of uh, read out or summarize the questions and uh, request uh, our panelists one by one to answer them. 
in one go because they are professors, so they wouldn't mind if the questions are bunched up. And then if there is time, I will have one question also, one or two questions for them. Let's see. Now from Sri Dinesh Patak, he says that why is that Biden administration focused on China, but not cognizant of Sino-Pak axis of a Marxist dictatorship and a fundamentalist regime? So that is Sri Dinesh Patak. And then uh, there is Dr. Uh, there is Gitesh Sharma. Any understanding of any kind to defuse Ukraine crisis has potential to seriously damage Biden. He would be accused of surrendering to Russia by domestic uh, critics. Is that a fair assessment? Then uh, we have uh, Sri S.P. Gaul. He says decline of U.S. hegemony began with the onslaught of Chinese emergence economically and militarily. Now, taking into account uh, the time factor, I thought I might as well put in my questions too. One is, uh, you know, we should always look at the big picture. Now, is it the case that a big picture is emerging where, as we know, there is already an axis between an axis which is getting deeper and deeper between Russia and China. Now, if the JCPOA doesn't get revived, then it is quite likely that Iran also will join that axis. Now, where China goes, Pakistan is likely to follow. Now, as of now, in Afghanistan, the Taliban are in power and there is some tension, but uh, basically, you know, there is a good rapport between the Pakistan ISI and the Taliban. So are we looking at a, an axis which links China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan and Afghanistan and in which case it is not good for America, but then America is far away, but it certainly is not good for India. Now, the second part of the question, second question is about NATO. Has not the NATO survived its necessity, its relevance? Because as Dr. Paul mentioned, you know, it was born during the bipolar world. Then we had what is called a unipolar moment. Now, I do not know how to describe where we are. Certainly it's not unipolar. It is not yet bipolar though, you know, it is moving towards, but it is also getting, you know, multipolar. So it's very confusing. So. If NATO has outlived its necessity, and it was mentioned by Dr. Anuradha that uh, Biden is very keen on remaining militarily in Europe. Why is he so keen on it? What does he get out of it? So over to you. Uh, let me request uh, Dr. Anuradha to step in first. Thank you. So uh, I'll answer as many questions as I can uh, uh, quickly. Uh, number one, uh, Dinesh Patrick's question, why is it that the Biden administration is focused on China but not cognizant of sino pak axis? Uh, I think they are cognizant of the sino pak axis, but they're willing to accept it because they need Pakistan for their policies in West Asia. So they're using Pakistan and Pakistan's quite willing to be used. Uh, it has been a client state of the US and now uh, it's very good at attaching itself to different powers. So it's now equally attached to China as it is to uh, the US. It's, they had done this once earlier in history when they had been a bridge for the US and China in fact. Um, in the 70s when uh, China and uh, the Soviet Union had fallen out. 
So they are hoping to be that bridge. So, and the US is very clear that they still need Pakistan and they're very clear that they know about the sino Park access, but they prefer to ignore it currently, but they will use it when they wish. Uh, secondly, um, there is this question of uh, how to defuse the Ukrainian crisis and the potential damage to Biden. Uh, he would be accused of surrendering to Russia, but I think they can, the, the Americans are controlling the narrative to such an extent that even if there's a diffusion of the crisis, they will declare it their victory, as will Russia. So it depends on who is willing to listen to whom. So uh, that's really, they will never accept a defeat. For example, it's very clear there was a defeat even from Afghanistan, but they still declare it, you know, like it was a wonderful thing that they've done. Um, so uh, uh, they forget about how their credibility is uh, damaged and their legitimacy with the third world and their whole idea of liberalism and liberal de democratic peace, which is entirely for the West. It's not there for the third world, developing world or anyone else. Uh, there was a, there's a question as why should Bi Biden cut France and Germany to size? He gains nothing. In fact, he gains a lot. He gains hegemony. He gains retaining his hold in Europe which he wants. He gains in controlling trade ties, which were, they were losing. And uh, they want to compete ultimately with China. And they, China has made a, the BRI till towards Germany. So they want to retain that, uh, the Americans, their control over uh, Germany. So they'll go after the Russians first. And then of course they're going after the Chinese, but more so. There's a question of why the significance of this topic and what does it mean for India? Now, I really want to address this because it means a lot. <coughs> India has a deep partnership with Russia. And I think the Indian statement in the Security Council debate on Ukraine was important and a very clear and good statement where they called for a diffusion of the crisis, a de-escalation. And during the Quad meet in Australia, the Indian foreign minister again refused to say that Quad is linked in any way to this crisis. And he said very clearly that our statement in the Security Council stands. Meanwhile, India's talks with Russia, its channel with Russia is open and they, India will not align with US militarism on this issue. They, U.S. would like to drag India into a confrontation with China and a bipolar world if they can't get a unipolar world. They hate the idea of multipolarity. Now, of course, it depends on India whether they want to stick to the idea of multipolarity or they want to move towards bipolarity. I think bipolarity would be harmful. And I think the current position, the strategic ambiguity, where at least they're arguing that there should be a diffusion of crisis, they have no interest in actually moving towards uh, any uh, pole is a, is a good thing. So really uh, there are ways where, uh, you know, I don't believe that Putin's, uh, you know, this whole thing of ego, et cetera. Uh, Putin is reflecting a very nationalist position. The people of Russia are behind him. Uh, and so I think it would be best if there were countries which would help de-escalate. So that is my answer really. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Anuratha. Now let us request uh, uh, Professor Paul. Thank you very much. I'll just pick up a few points since uh, Professor Anuradha has answered uh, most of them. I respond to your question, Ambassador, about why NATO is still persisting. This is actually a big academic topic in literature on alliances. They call it stickiness, uh, institutional stickiness. Some institutions stick around for reasons beyond their creation. And that's the case here to some extent. But I think there are two things happening. One is the Europeans don't have enough military power alone. They need uh, unity. They need America there. And in order for America to be there, you need the alliance. So the alliance structure is already created. As you know, they have headquarters in Brussels massive uh, capacity all around. 
The second is these new uh, members are biggest defenders of uh, NATO and uh, especially the ex-Soviet states, the Baltic states, as well as East European states. They really cherish NATO. In fact, uh, somebody was telling me that when uh, Czech Republic joined NATO, all the church bells in Prague uh, uh, started uh, you know, ringing for hours and hours. This was uh, coming into the West getting out of the Soviet uh, Russian yoke, as they call it. Now, quoting unquote, by the way, I'm not saying everything is always true. So as long as this desire of these small states to be out of uh, Russian control, uh, they will support this. So NATO is here to stay. But the biggest mistake NATO did was to alienate Russia so rapidly. And the Partnership for Peace was never successful. Soviet proposals under Gorbachev onwards for what you call uh, a common home, common European security, it was all on paper and uh, Germany at that time was uh, sympathetic. But I think uh, they need to rethink that, the Helsinki process, the whole cooperation security in Europe, CSC process, and somehow avoid this uh, another bipolar or tripolar competition that NATO will eventually create. And true security to these small states won't come until Russia is also secure. Of course, Russia has ambitions and its definition of security is sometimes, by the way, dominance. And so it's, it's a very different uh, ball game. So there is this problem of great powers trying to recreate spheres of influence. Russia is uh, coming to back to that mode and the United States does not want to give up its sphere of influence. China is trying to create a carve out a sphere of influence. But from the small states point of view, including the middle powers, it's not a great idea. We don't want the great powers to have these spheres of influence and dominate the system as they used to. And so I think um, the challenge is how to combine the aspirations of the big powers and small states or middle powers as well. And that's where the implications for India. India is in a, some say in a sweet spot, others say not so. India wants uh, uh, to eat the cake too, but India has got many constraints. Uh, it is geopolitically in a very important uh, Indo-Pacific area, which actually is uh, uh, becoming more and more important. But that also brings responsibilities and potential for uh, strategic alignments. So the United States, I think, think somehow India can be uh, joining, uh, joined to that alliance that they created. Quad is not a formal alliance, but it has the soft balancing uh, approach. It is now becoming more and more institutionalized. But as far as I know, India does not want the Russia part into it, or Ukraine was not even mentioned at the last meeting, the foreign ministers under in India's insistence, it seems. And so that is not what the United States wants. They want this to be the Eastern NATO, if possible, uh, which is not in interest of India to some extent, great extent. So India has a, a big challenge how to navigate the situation. India has definitely got this desire for strategic autonomy and non-alignment was a reflection of that. And so, how to remain quasi aligned with the United States at the same time maintain your strategic autonomy and to gain certain things that only Russia can offer, which including certain weapons at this point, and over time not to escalate the divisions and polarity in the system where India may benefit, but India may not benefit as much as uh, one would expect uh, if the system is uh, polarized in a big way. So globalization has been good for India, not for all Indians, uh, mainly because it increased India's opportunity for engagement, trade, and investment. India has to increase that process. And for that to happen, definitely. Yes, uh, 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 please go ahead. Yeah, so I'll stop there. And uh, I think we can conclude, I think. Thank you, Dr. Paul, uh, uh, for... Uh, answering all those questions. So there was one question from uh, 
Mr. Rajiv Gopal about uh, impact on India, which uh, has already been answered. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's almost time that we close. It is clear that I think you're frozen, Ambassador. I think we've lost the connection, so we can just I think form we, a we, we can, Yes, that's better because ambassadors yeah. and IIC webinar seems to yes. be not working. So yeah. thank you all for attending. And on behalf of the ambassador, we are going to close uh, Professor uh, Chinoy and myself. And uh, hopefully we'll continue this conversation at some other forum. Have a thank good you. day to all. Yes.